Hello, my name is Tony. Dan Curtis, American director, producer, writer of TV shows and feature films, created the daytime soap opera Dark Shadows, which ran from 1966 to 1971, spanning 1,225 episodes and amassing a huge cult following. It spawned two feature films, House of Dark Shadows in 1970 and Night of Dark Shadows in 1971, the subjects of this double feature review. Now I've chosen to look at them both for two reasons. Firstly, I've seen them previously in the cinema venue of my misspent youth. And secondly, the first one was requested by Chris Barad, who subscribed to the channel and posts regular comments, bless him. I imagined it would be only a matter of time before some bright spark requested the second of the two, and I thought to get it over with. Hence a double feature review. Now I'm not fond of them because they take twice as long to do and take twice as much work and twice as much thought on my part, but once it's done and out of my road, I can concentrate on getting on with something else, I thought. Dark Dark Shadows, a gothic melodrama set in New England, was bombing like a motherfucker and facing cancellation by ABC, until in desperation Curtis introduced supernatural elements, including a tortured vampire character, Blunderbuss Collings. What's that? Oh yeah, right, right, right. Barnabas. Barnabas Collings. The show never made it to UK shores, so I have very little idea of who everyone is, or what they're called, or where they are, or why they're there, or what they're doing. Anyway, excuse my ignorance. Something you'll be used to if you spend any time on here. I'll work on it. I promise. Blunderbuss was played by Jonathan Frid and was so popular that he became a household name, an overnight sensation at the age of 44. Women fans reportedly sent him nude pictures, presumably of themselves, and even teenage girls got the hots for the saturnine undead romantic with a face like a freshly dug potato patch and hair like a melted plastic beetle's wig. Fucking annoying. Really fucking annoying. What the hell's the matter with women, eh? Ladies, why? Now the problem with long-running soap operas is that they, by their very nature, can't help but alienate newcomers. You land cold, you don't know who any other characters are, or where they're at, or what their backstory is, because all that has been developed and established over time. And there's no way that they're gonna do a recap every episode just on the off chance that some newbie might have tuned in. So you either accept that and try to get into it as best you can, or you don't bother and leave it the fuck alone. House of Dark Shadows, the big screen version, like any given TV episode presupposes you know just what the fuck is going on and who these characters are and where they live and how they're related or connected. When I first saw it, supported by the oddball Stacy Keach black comedy The Travelling Executioner, I knew shit all about the setup and quickly realised any effort on my part to functionally piece it together was doomed to fail and that the film didn't care anyway and wasn't about to make any expositional concessions on my behalf. So rather than give myself the grief, I quickly threw in that particular a towel, reasoning that as I'd paid the price of admission, I was just going to go with it and see what happened without trying to figure out the details and character dynamics. House of Dark Shadows starts off at night. It seems to be set in a country estate where there is a main house which is well preserved and another house which is falling to rack and ruin. In the grounds is a family crypt and an empty indoor swimming pool which is disused and disintegrating. Someone called Maggie, Catherine Lee Scott, is searching for someone called David, presumably a kid who has gone missing. In an outbuilding, she runs into a drunken guy garrulous handyman called Willie John Carlin, who is rambling on about some clues on a piece of paper he's waving around. He believes this will lead him to the long-lost Collins family treasure. Willie is apparently an employee of the Collins family who own the place. Roger Collins, Louis Edmonds, turns up and demands Willie help in the search for David. Willie more or less tells him to piss off and find the kid himself. He's his son after all. Roger sacks him on the spot and advises him to pick up his wages in the morning. Willie stumbles around like a complete doofus, the clues leading him to the family more mausoleum where he finds a hidden coffin wrapped in chains. Breaking the chains, he finds instead of treasure, a 175-year-old vampire, Blunderbuss, who attacks and enslaves him to do his bidding. Surprise! We're in Dracula Renfield territory, folks. Initially, on a bit of a blood-sucking roll after a very long dry spell chained in that coffin, Blunderbuss, Jonathan Frid, goes on a spree attacking Daphne, Lisa Richards, who is a secretary to Collins family matriarch Elizabeth Collins Stoddard, Joan Bennett. He also fangs some local girls. Daphne is found and rescued by Jeff, Roger Davis, who is Maggie's boyfriend. She is treated by Dr. Julia Hoffman, Grayson Hall, who is a Collins family friend. Another family friend is one Professor Stokes, Thea David, who's a sort of 
Van Helsing character hanging around on the fringes. Maggie, it is revealed, is David's governess, the kid who went missing for a hilarious prank and is really an insufferable little dick, I might add. And then there's Carolyn Stoddard, Nancy Barrett, who is Elizabeth's daughter and in her wake trails her fiancé Todd, Donald Briscoe. Eventually, it became apparent who these people were and how they related to each other, but it's bloody hard work getting there and reaching this level of understanding. I mean, I don't work that hard when I'm working at work, so that a film should bust my balls in this way doesn't leave me best disposed towards it. Blunderbuss pays the Collins family a visit, introducing himself as the last surviving Collins relative from England. He bears a striking resemblance to a portrait in the entrance hall, which is hardly surprising since it's a painting of him. The family are convinced and welcome him with open throats. Professor Stokes is more cautious, but it's not like he's got any say in anything, so fuck him. Blunderbuss further ingratiates himself by giving Elizabeth a priceless family heirloom, a presumed missing diamond necklace. So taken are they, they allow him to stay in the old Collins house, which he says he would like to renovate. Good luck with that, Fixer Upper doesn't come close to describing this fucking ruin. Carolyn is suspicious of Blunderbuss, so he gives her a good fang in to bring her on board. She is now in his thrall, but also consumed by jealousy when he makes a beeline for Maggie. Maggie closely resembles Josette, his long dead fiance. See, apparently back in the day, Blunderbuss hacked off some witch who took her revenge by killing him and turning him into a vampire. Josette didn't fancy being one of the living dead for all eternity beside her paramour, so threw herself off a cliff. Then Blunderbuss Blunderbuss's dad, who couldn't bring himself to destroy his monstrous son, locked him in a coffin without so much as a pocket chest set to while away the centuries. Angry with Carolyn, Blunderbuss drains her of a bit too much blood. She dies, but after the funeral, rises again as a vampire and tries to feed on David. Unfortunately, she fails and the little shit lives, but no one believes his story because he'd been such a lying prick in the past. Oh, apart from Professor Stokes, who announces that there's vampirism afoot. No one believes him either, apart from Dr. Hoffman, who has fallen in love with with Blunderbuss and wants to cure him. Injections of a serum to kill the vampire infection in his blood sort of work and almost make him human. He can walk in daylight, for instance. But there's a bit of a side effect in that he physically ages to all of his 175 years. So he throttles Dr. Hoffman to death and feeds on Maggie to restore himself to full-blown vampire status. Meanwhile, the local fuzz has come on board armed with crosses and silver bullets. They corner Carolyn, who is trying to turn Todd into someone interested in fat chance with her teeth and hold her down while Stokes delivers his patented stake through the heart therapy. It all turns to shit for Blunderbuss, so he retreats to some nearby island after abducting Maggie. There he intends to convert her to full vampire slave bride in a mock wedding ceremony in a ruined church. Jeff steps up as the hero of the piece, heading the island, finding first Professor Stokes, who's become a vampire. He empties a revolver full of silver bullets into him. And next, Roger, who has also become a vampire. He stakes him with a big crossbow bolt. At the church, he aims a crossbow at Blunderbuss, who has Maggie lying on an altar before him. He's certainly out to alter her. As he fires, that idiot Willie gets in the way and takes a bolt in the spine for Team Vamp. Blunderbuss wrenches the bolt out of Willie and discards it. He mesmerises Jeff and just before he chows down on Maggie's jugular, Willie retrieves the crossbow bolt and seeking redemption for being such a world-class dick, plunges it into Blunderbuss before he dies. Jeff snaps out of his trance, difficult to tell the difference to be honest, and whacks the bolt in further, ending the undead life of the vicious vampire. Maggie comes round and they leave together. As the credits are fading, the body of Blunderbuss morphs into a bat and flies off. Shit. Does this sound like the sort of thing you want to see? Let me help you with that decision. It's a messy concoction and unless you're familiar with the show, the characters and what it's all about, you won't care much what happens to anyone. Lack of essential information means you can't relate readily to anyone you see on screen and you won't invest in them or their activities concern yourself about their fates. You're going to feel a bit excluded from it all, at least I certainly did. All the performances are different shades and configurations of overripe melodrama, defined by exaggerated reactions and unconvincingly demonstrative emoting. Its soap opera roots are deep and clingy and pervasively ingrained throughout. Subtle, it ain't, and the origins of the piece are writ large. Fritz Barnabas Collins is the best value for money. Despite his hyper-theatrical overacting, he does generate some sense of ethereal melancholy and even something approaching sympathy on the odd occasion. The film comes alive mostly when he's on screen. There's an amazing scene when he beats Willie with a cane. In an attack of such ferocious savagery, it borders on a crazy and cruel, sort of overextended slapstick routine. If it doesn't raise a laugh, it will surely make you smile at least. Best of all, you will expect that after such a sustained physical lambasting, in, Willie must surely be dead. No, he's fine. Few scratches and bruises. Fucking guy must be made of titanium. 
I had a hard time believing that Blunderbuss would prefer Maggie to Carolyn, whatever dead past love she looks like. Maggie's nice, sure, but Carolyn is super hot. Really? Yes, all right, get this straight. This isn't my unconscious sexism rearing its head. It's my conscious sexism. Make sure you're clear about that when you complain. And what the hell is wrong with Joan Bennett in this movie? Not the greatest actress ever, but she'd been at it since her screen debut in 1916 and was more than competent. She looks and acts like someone with terminal narcolepsy here. More like a prop than a character. Thankfully, she was more animated by the time of her final role as Madame Blanc in Dario Argento's Astonishing Suspiria in 1970. But in House of Dark Shadows, she seems, for want of a better term, switched off. In its favour, the level of violence and bloodshed is far in excess of what I imagine was permitted in the TV show. Plenty of fake, oversaturated red stuff leaking from wounds, spurting from bodies, splashing around the scenery. In that respect, Curtis almost outhammers Hammer with the Max Factor gore quotient. And there are some genuinely effective jump scares from a time when the genre hadn't overused them to the point of ennui. Fans of the show are probably those who will get the most out of it, will benefit from the nostalgia, will engage with it most easily. For me, though, it's far from top tier, a passable, gothic-flavoured fangfest. It did well enough at the box office in the States to warrant a movie sequel, Night of Dark Shadows, a year later. By this time, Dark Shadows, the TV show, was off air, and Frid wanted to move on to other things, like career obscurity, which he effortlessly achieved. Although, in fairness, he headlined Oliver Stone's directorial debut, Seizure, in 1974, which I've never seen and keep meaning to try and get hold of, but I'm not sure if I'm missing much. The problem with Night of Dark Shadows, apart from feeling rushed, is it's terminally boring and mediocre, lacking in the faster pace and gory action of its predecessor. It's a ghost reincarnation story that has nothing much in the way of chills and shocks to grip and stimulate the audience. If the aim was to make something more story and character driven, there's nothing wrong with that. But the narrative is so dense, needlessly complex and incoherent that I soon found myself losing interest fast. Combined with a listless script by Sam Hall and uninspired direction from Dan Curtis, it doesn't bode well, folks. Let's quickly tool around the grounds then. Quentin Collins, David Selby, inherits the family Pyle Collinswood. He's an artist who moves there with his young wife, Tracy, Kate Jackson, who would later be one of Charlie's angels. Grayson Hall turns up again as the housekeeper, Carlotta. Soon as Quentin lands, he starts having visions and nightmares based around events that took place over a hundred years ago. His ancestor, Charles, also played by Selby, was porking his brother's wife, Angelique, Lara Parker. Local belief had it that Angelique was a witch, and this leads to her being accused by local religious nut bar Reverend Strack, David back again, and executed by neck stretching from a big tree in the grounds. Then Charles' brother Gabriel Christopher Pennock, still bearing a tiny grudge and allowing bitterness to creep in, has him sealed up in the family crypt with Angelique's corpse. Bit of an overreaction, I think, but there you go, that sibling rivalry for you. I imagine Prince Willie would happily visit an equivalent fate on his brother Hazmat. I can't really hack through the rest of the plot in detail because, oh Jesus God, I lack the will or mental resilience. Let's just say that Quentin is Charles reincarnated, Colotta is the reincarnation of a child who lived in the house and idolised Angelique, Angelique's ghost is haunting the place and wants to become flesh and reunite with her love. Willie from House of Dark Shadows is back, not as a reincarnation or a ghost, but John Carlin playing Quentin's friend Alex. And Nancy Barrett resurfaces as Alex's wife Claire. They're staying in the guest house in the grounds. Nancy Barrett is hotter than Kate Jackson, but Lara Parker is hotter than both of them. And this is what I've been reduced to in order to find something worth while to occupy me whilst watching it. Which of the three women do I find most attractive? And that's not a good sign if it's all I've got, which is where it's at mostly. Night of Dark Shadows managed to get itself an R rating in the States and an X rating in the UK, which, if anything, is bloody misleading. There is nothing in this film that justifies those ratings. No explicit violence, sex, nudity or adult themes, or anything remotely challenging or sensor baiting. Even at the time it was released, it should have been awarded an A or PG at most. So any expectations I had, the bar for which having been set by the style and content of the previous film, were completely unfulfilled. Curtis would produce much better work, as he certainly had and would go on to do. It's really one for Dark Shadows fans and completists only. In general terms, anyone else is going to be bored, will quickly lose interest, and most probably switch it off before they reach the midpoint. On revisiting it, that's certainly what I felt like doing. My advice then? 
If you feel an overwhelming urge to watch only one of these two films, I would recommend House of Dark Shadows. It may be soapy, melodramatic, inarticulate, badly acted and poorly scripted goth junk, but it's got Fred's blunderbuss, brisk pacing and gore fight in its corner. Night of Dark Shadows got Lara Parker and her impressive décolletage. It's not enough. Thank you for your kind indulgence. My expectation is that after subjecting me to this, Chris Barard will give me a break. What do you say, Chris? I mean, I struggle to your man. Meanwhile, if anyone can find the time to comment, like, dislike, or subscribe, I would appreciate it. I will return. Not sure when or how long the recovery period is for this sort of trauma, but I'm hoping sooner rather than later. Bye for now, pilgrims.